On this edition of the Nesson Celtics podcast, we recap Boston's last week, Jalen Brown's emergence, and the current state of Romeo Langford. Welcome back to the Nesson Celtics podcast. I'm Chris Grenham, joined as always by Adam London. We are recording this on Thursday, December 5th. So less than 24 hours after the Celtics took down the Miami Heat 112 to 93. It was another slow start, but another solid finish for the Celtics, which is a positive. Obviously, we'd like them to get off to a, uh, you know, quicker start, but it's become a trend as of late, but they've been able to battle back into games like they did against a good Heat team, uh, you know, that was coming off a back-to-back. They... uh, Uh, were in Toronto and finished in overtime the night before. But let's start with that win against the Heat. Adam, what were your general takeaways, I guess, we can start with there? Sure. I thought my biggest takeaway was in a game that you played without Marcus Smart, who was dealing with illness, as well as his oblique injury, to turn in one of your best defensive efforts of the season. I mean, Jimmy Butler still went off for 37, and 37 is 37, but... I guess you could almost call it an empty 37 just because yep. their second top scorer was old friend Kelly Olenek, who had yeah. a booming 12 points. Yeah. So to limit the Heat, who are playing good ball, the 93 on a night where your best defender is out is pretty encouraging. Yeah, I mean, that was the first first time all season that the Celtics have started a uh, starting unit without Gordon Hayward or Marcus Smart. Yep. So obviously those are two big contributors, but like you said on the defensive end, um, it was nice. Shemi Ojale came up big. We'll get to him a little later. Jalen Brown paced the offense for the majority of the night. Uh, he's improved in a variety of ways. I know um, Logan, Nesson.com's Logan Mullen probably doesn't want to hear that, but he really has. He had 31 points in 34 minutes. He was 10 of 20 from the field, 5 and 9 from deep, 4 rebounds. He was plus 9. I mean, when Jalen Brown came into the league, he couldn't dribble. No. Like, he was one of those classic guys who had negative court vision which is pretty common for guys even if they're top draft picks coming out of college and he just simply couldn't put the ball on the floor effectively now he is dribbling with confidence he can score off the dribble with ease he stays low he keeps his center of gravity low um that was he he showcased that plenty against miami but i mean he is providing a lot for this team on a night where you know Jason Tatum kind of got off to a slow start. He finished with 19. Kemba Walker at 28, so he was yeah. tremendous. But it's really nice to have Jalen Brown to you know rely on as that primary scorer, especially when Gordon Hayward's out, right? Right. Yeah. And that 31, like you were touching on, it was it was kind of a blend of you know it was he wasn't getting it all the same way. He had those off the dribble points where he was attacking the basket. And he's becoming somewhat of like a lethal corner three-point shooter. Yeah. I mean, he when he has that shot going, his his repertoire is, is pretty impressive. And I thought it was his performance was a little poetic in a sense that when the Celtics fans were dying for that big trade yeah. years back, yeah. and obviously Jimmy Butler was one of the names he was people the guy. brought up. Yeah, it's like Larry Fitzgerald of the Patriots. Right. Yeah, and in all these scenarios where you're thinking about Jimmy Butler coming to Boston, people were almost volunteering to drive Jalen Brown to the airport <laughs> as part of those deals, and for Jalen to explode for 31 in the night that he was covered by Butler, you know, one of the better defenders in the league, pretty often to go for 31. I mean, that's that's no small feat. Yeah, and people were offering to drive Jalen Brown out of town like as early as the beginning of the sure, season, like yeah. as, as recent as the beginning yeah. of the season. There was a lot of doubters when he signed his contract extension. He's responded extremely well. Um, obviously, it's it's extremely evident that he's put a lot of work into his game. He was, I mean, I don't want to say one-dimensional on the offensive end, but he was that classic young guy who would just put his head down barge towards the hoop kind of like rj barrett does right Right. now and just bury himself underneath the basket he doesn't do that anymore he's got great core vision his passing has improved he's also six for eight from the free throw line last night he was horrible at the charity stripe to begin his career so that was nice um we mentioned him before but shemi ojale was really really good last night um actually do you want to put in that jalen sound before we go in let's do it all right so we have a little sound from last night's game so um, we're going to talk about this briefly before we get to Shemi. Uh, Jalen kind of hinted a lot 
about his work sort of approaching blitzes from opposing team defenses. So here's what he had to say uh, after last night's win. Comfortable with the blitz. Um, they're blitzing Kimba uh, and blitzing JT. So um, just being aggressive out of that because they got a um, it's four on three on the backside and I'm just trying to be aggressive. Is that something you can learn from watching film or is it just a matter of being out there on the court? Being out there but also watching, you know, seeing it and getting more comfortable with it. Um, the last few games people have been blitzing the same way. So um, just being aggressive out of it and trying to make plays. And hopefully, you know, if they continue to blitz, I'll continue to make plays. But if they stop, then it'll open up guys like Kimba and JT on some of those screens. So that's just another uh, example of Jalen's development. I mean, that's something that he, he couldn't really read blitzes all that well when he came out. Really, no young player can, but he's developed that very quickly. He couldn't yeah. do that even late last year. Um, so that's another positive. Uh, but let's jump to Shemi, Shemi Ojale. He, a couple weeks ago on this podcast, you and I basically rendered him useless. Yeah. Uh, and we'll own up to that because he... He seemed useless at times with some pretty pointless minutes um, earlier in the season. He played 24 minutes last night. He was plus 21, 5.7 rebounds. He was nearly perfect on the defensive end. I don't know if that's an exaggeration. Maybe it's just a little recency bias. But he's been good as of late. But last night against Miami, like he was really, really good. Brad right. Stevens praised him, said it was basically no surprise that his 24 minutes were the team's best 24 minutes. So... What did you see from Shemi last night? No, and I feel like Shemi is one of those players, you see it across sports, where he's the guy that catches a lot of flack from fans who are just watching from a very, you know, I guess, short-sighted point of view. They're just yeah. seeing what's in front of them. But then when you hear their teammates talk about them, it's just overflowing right. praise. And you see that often with Shemi. I mean, you like you said, with Brad and Jalen after the game had – a lot of praise for Shemi too and he's one of those guys he's becoming he's kind of reminding me of early early Marcus Smart I was, days. That's funny you say you that. I was, I was just about to say that. Yeah. The offense obviously is a work in progress right. I'll say it um, but yeah it's the energy it's the defense and you know sometimes I mean we've seen these Celtics teams kind of be plagued by slow starts or just moments of slow play and when he comes in and for whatever reason he brings that energy and that spark right and he's always ready in that sense because he didn't yeah. start last night he started games for this team before but he didn't start last night grant williams started played 22 minutes he was relatively good on the defensive end as well as he always is um but they went with these like twin tower type lineups to start the game and they went away from that after the first quarter um and then they started shemi with the starting unit to begin the second half and that's a situation that again to make adjustments, you know, in a game where he might not have planned to have played 24 minutes. Um, it's it's nice to have a guy who can provide that spark. Um, Grant Williams also played 18 minutes, not 22 minutes last night. Uh, but either way, that's nice, and you're right about the Marcus Smart comparison. Let's listen to what um, Jalen Brown said after the game. He was providing praise just like Tatum was, just like Brad Stevens was uh, in regards to Shemi's min minutes. Brad said that the defense was at its best whenever Shemi was out on the floor. Um, what was he doing specifically to make an impact on that? Communication. Shemi, um, you can always hear him talking. Uh, Shemi does a good job of being communicat uh, communicative on defense. So um, he's an anchor down there. So um, we started the second half with him, and he, and he helped us out a lot. Yeah, so again, he noted there Shemi's communication is another thing that we can tie to Marcus Smart. Marcus Smart wasn't very fine-tuned when he first came into the league but his communication was always there um, specifically on the defensive side of the ball his game is an offensive uh, work in progress just like Marcus Smart's was really up until last season um, so that was nice and this isn't like a once this isn't you know out of nowhere he was pretty good against the Knicks as well um, I think he was 19 minutes I think he played yeah no and it's funny too that you almost forget just because of how his role has been crafted over these years, but he's one of the longest tenured Celtics right yeah. now, just of how many new faces they have. Yeah. So you can see already he's a guy that, you know, has some, you know, command in, amongst this group, and, you know, people look for him to make an impact when he's on the floor. Yeah, definitely. And before we move on from, totally move on from the Heat game, we had Jalen Brown blowing kisses to the Miami Heat yeah. bench, which 
he kind of landed a pretty great line after the game. He said that it was toward Kelly Olynyk. He didn't know if Kelly Olynyk saw it, but he said he felt it, which I thought was pretty funny. Kelly Olynyk is one of those guys who he's been back to the Garden plenty of times. Yeah. He always gets kind of like mixed reactions from the crowds. Right. Like, like there was a decent amount of people booing him last night when he would get the ball, which I felt was kind of weird. I mean, I guess maybe there isn't. They're not Celtics fans might not be as familiar with the rest of this Heat roster. They're not going to boo Duncan Robinson, so right. they go after Kelly Olynyk. But um, he's always a guy who uh, gets some sort of reaction. He also just sold his place in Boston, yeah. which I thought was kind of bizarre, but he didn't right. close the door on coming back. Right. No, and I think, I mean, in my lifetime right now, I would say Olenek by far owns the most bizarre and unexpected performance. Yeah. I mean, that, that 26 points, and I think it was like in 28 minutes off the bench in that game seven it's, in the East semis against the Wizards. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember watching that, and at the beginning it was like, all right, this is cool, you know, he's providing, and then you're like, okay. And towards the end you were just like, all right, what is yeah, going on Yeah, what the here? hell is going you know? on, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, it is kind of, I think just as Bostonians, we're just wired where if we don't know how to react to someone are just our first instinct is to boo because they don't play here anymore. They, yeah, which I guess is fair. Right, but yeah, I mean, credit to Kelly Olenek. He played well enough to get a decent bag from Miami, and you know, yeah. he's, he's becoming a decent role player for them as well. I was on the other side of that Eastern Conference semifinals. As a Washington Wizards fan, yeah. watching Kelly Olenek tear apart your favorite team is one of the most demeaning things. It's a tough way to go out. It is a really tough way to go out. It was one of, the, one of my low points. Being a Washington Wizards fan creates plenty of low points yeah. throughout your basketball watching experience. Kelly Olenek yeah. dropping 28 or whatever in God's name it was is is certainly one of the low points. And just little moments from last night that, I don't know if enjoyment's the right word, but anytime him and Cantor were matched up against each <laughs> yeah. other, it almost felt like you were watching the game in slow motion. Yeah. It's like the two slowest moving players. Just moving in, in molasses. Yeah. Ennis Cantor always looks like, I think we talked about this earlier in the year, he always looks like he's gassed. And yeah. I don't know if he is or he's just slow. He's a bigger guy, so I wouldn't be surprised right. if he's just slow. Yeah. But it's almost like painful to watch. Yeah, and it's funny because just from like a pure optic standpoint, he looks like maybe the most in shape player behind Shaq right. on the team. Right, so. and he'll be the first one to tell you that. So yeah, right. um, if we're going to continue to talk while we're on the topic of Kelly Olynyk and former Celtics players, we might as well talk about Kyrie. We haven't um, recorded a podcast since the Celtics had their back-to-back against the Nets in which they split the games, but the main storyline was Kyrie not playing in either game. First off, if, if you had any... If you thought that Kyrie was going to play Wednesday night, Thanksgiving Eve, at TD Garden, you you didn't watch last year's team close enough, and you didn't right. follow Kyrie. There's no chance, no chance. In there's no chance he was going to play in that game. And I'll go as far to say there's no chance he's going to play against the Celtics at all I would this season. Yeah. I mean, he's missed six straight games against his former teams. He missed four in a row against Cleveland, now two in a row against the Celtics. He's just he's not going to play against the Celtics. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, my reaction, and I don't know if this is taboo among Celtics fans, I was just, obviously, you knew Celtics fans were going to let him have it. Yeah. But it, was, it just struck me how much they cared. I mean, it was just like... It was a little, it, was, it wasn't a great look. Right, it wasn't a great look. Yeah. But, like, you heard all the Celtics players talk about it, and granted, to some level, it's just media speak, but they yeah. were like hey, like, we're still close with Kyrie, right. still consider him a friend. It didn't work out. You know, there, the issues of last year extended well beyond him. Yeah. And, I mean, reg- it seems like regardless of what the players say or how much they defend him, he's just always going to be public enemy number one. Yeah, and I'm not saying by – I'm not saying that Celtics fans should like the guy. Like, no. I totally understand yeah. why they dislike him. His tenure in Boston was atrocious. Like, it was – there's no reason for them to like him. I don't blame them at all. But from a Kyrie standpoint, if you're Kyrie and, granted, he doesn't think this way, but if you're Kyrie and everyone in TD Garden is booing you and ch- you know tossing out anti-Kyrie chants, and then after the game, 
your ex teammates are basically defending you and saying, you know, yeah, we're still tight with him, like you said, we're still tight with him, and he was a great teammate, nothing but good things to say. He would have come out for once actually looking like maybe even the good guy, sure. which is rare. And he could use it. He could use it. So he would have come out looking like the good guy, and he just couldn't, could not bite his tongue. He had to go right. onto his Instagram story and just blow the whole thing up. And that surprised me a little bit because Kyrie's really not quick to hit social media. No, he's you know, not. He, he's a far cry from the Antonio Browns of the world right. who will go on any second. So yeah. it just, that struck me a little bit that he just couldn't. I was surprised. But at the same time, he kind of we- like wove it into his diatribe where he's like, if no one else is going to speak, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Which, I don't know, like, cool that you want to be, like, the guy, but at the same time, like you said, he could have made out a lot, a lot better if he stayed silent. But at the same time, it's clear that he's beyond the point of caring. Of how yeah, he, he, doesn't give a, he doesn't give a crap. And now, Yeah, go ahead. I think the biggest, one of the bigger reasons, twofold, why I'm surprised the Celtics are still so passionate in their hatred for him. One, you have a team right now that's second in the East, is insanely likable, yeah. and have proven already that, you know... You're better off. Yeah, they're yeah. not. They're better off, and they're not like a flash in the pan. Right. I mean, that winning streak, obviously, you know, they might have caught some breaks, but it's clear this team's going to be in the they're mix good. at the end. They're a good team. And two, you're watching all the reports that are coming out of Brooklyn. You're seeing how, you know, inconsistent they are. Right. Like, if you're a diehard Celtics fan, shouldn't you be finding some, like twisted joy and you're like yeah he's their problem right yeah exactly he's in the rear view mirror for us we don't have to deal with them and we can watch this because it's starting to think now like even when Durant comes back I don't think it's going to be all fine and dandy over there no I don't think I don't think so either and it's I totally agree about your last point where yeah you need to take some sort of pleasure in seeing yeah. how poorly not it's not going like it's not a dumpster fire over sure. there in Brooklyn but it's not great it's not what they imagined it to be and so I think Celtics fans should be happy with where they are they should be happy with where the Nets are yeah. and that should be enough to just kind of move on it's time to move on I get it you can dislike him but don't let it anchor every feeling you have towards basically the NBA at large yeah. um, I, I mean he I don't want to dive into his Instagram story. I think a lot of he did make uh, you know the occasional. Uh, I don't disagree with everything he said in there. He's right. A lot of people, you know, I don't like. My biggest issue with pro sports is the fact that a lot of people treat athletes like they're zoo animals. Yeah, and they're just and not humans. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and so he made that point valid. But to claim that basketball in itself and sports and entertainment are ignorant and obtrusive when. He's making millions and hundreds of millions of dollars off of that is a bit hypocritical, yep. I think. You can't really then go and manipulate that to to grab, you know, your bag. Uh, I respect everyone who goes out there and gets their money, of course, but I thought there were some certain uh, hypocritical points. One more thing before we move on from Kyrie. I think it is hilarious how identical Nets Twitter is right now compared to what Celtics Twitter is at this point last yep. year, you know, because it's – You know, he'll be outside the huddle, like, smiling and laughing. And someone in Nets Twitter, just like someone in Boston last year would do, would grab the clip and be like, oh, look how unhappy Kyrie looks. And he's, like, laughing. It's it's pretty hysterical how the vicious, like, NBA Twitter cycle just goes round and round. And I think an equally hilarious uh, byproduct of this was that we got a vintage soundbite from one of my favorite athletes of all time, Kevin Garnett, who... When they asked if he was surprised, Kyrie left. Couldn't have said no any faster yeah. and out of the laugh. The only thing that I thought was funny was when he was talking about it, he mentioned why Pierce was such a good fit in Boston. Right. He said Pierce is a perfect fit for it. Paul wants the shot every time. I'm like, it's not really a problem yeah. for Kyrie. Yeah. Kyrie yeah. wants the ball every yeah. time too. I think the clear difference was that, I don't know, obviously Pierce was here during the dog days, kind right. of saw the whole thing through. Right kind of worked for it where Kyrie was thrust and immediately it was like, all right, you guys are winning a title now. Right. Um, Yeah, I mean, it is just comparing the two, I think is a little off balance, but it was vintage KG to just to chime in and be like, yeah, he didn't have the, he didn't have the cojones, Cojones, didn't have the cojones. I mean, yeah, that's vintage KG. 
Uh, KG certainly did have the cones. That's for sure. You know, so he he thrived here. But yeah, I thought that was great that we got some KG usage out of it. So before we move on to we're at about the quarter point ish in the NBA season, most teams have played uh, around twenty ish games. Um, so. Before we get to maybe some award talk, some James Harden uh, and Rockets complaints, uh, two quick notes about the Celtics. First, you and I spoke about this a little bit. Marcus Smart, he missed Thursday or Wednesday's game against the Heat uh, because he was sick, yep. but he was also hurt as well. Um, at what point do – he has one speed, obviously. Right. Everyone knows that. Yeah. Um, at what point do you consider a little bit of a load management type program for him – because you're going to need him down the stretch. You right. need a guy like him from a defensive standpoint, and now even from an offensive standpoint, to have his three-point shooting um, in a playoff series. Yeah, I think from obviously from a pure talent standpoint, you can make the case Smart isn't a top five on the Celtics. But as far as value and need, he might be two. Yeah, I mean that's a guy. Given like how poor this team. You know, when they're going bad, can be on defense if they don't have the right guys out there. I mean, that's a guy you need regardless of the opponent in the playoffs. Right. And I, obviously it would be extremely tough for a guy like Smart to agree to any type of load management yeah. uh, strategy, but it is something to consider. And if Hayward's able to come back, you know, two, three weeks, like they're seeing it, on, uh, they're projecting right now, it's just another body who kind of opens the door for that type of thing. And not just smart, but even a guy like Tatum who hasn't missed a game this year, yeah. just giving a guy a night off here and there with the long-term goal in mind. Right, yeah, and that, that's very true. You know, looking at this team now, giving smart a load management type plan isn't all that appealing. Yeah. But once they do get a guy like Hayward back, someone who can act as that primary ball handler that smart operates as plenty yep. of the time when Kemba's on the bench, you know Hayward's return certainly helps, and they're going to need him going forward to kind of operate a little. You know, they function better with him as a primary right. ball handler. Um, at the forefront of a lot of Celtics fans' minds right now is also Romeo Langford. Yeah, kid cannot catch a break. It seems like um, obviously he just it was a little ankle sprain, I believe, is what it was classified as, but he. he re-injured his right ankle Sunday um, in, for the main Red Claws in his first game back. He obviously didn't play in Summer League because he, when he was at Indiana, he played his entire loan season there with a torn ligament and a shooting thumb, yep. had surgery following the season, uh, had to go through rehab throughout the summer, so that's why he didn't play in Summer League. Then he's had a host of injuries since then. He was at the game last night. He didn't have a brace on his ankle. He seemed to be moving pretty well. It doesn't seem like they're all that concerned. I'm not sure if he'll be in Maine tonight. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. They play against the Bucks G League affiliate tonight. Uh, Vincent Poirier is also going up there to play. But at what point do you start to hit or at least break out the panic button with Romeo Langford? Because I'm not pressing it yet, right. but I think it's been removed from the drawer and it's now on the desk. Yeah, I think a lot of times we attach the injury-prone label to guys who have had, like, the big injury, like a torn ACL yeah. or whatever. But, I mean, with Langford, I mean, at the end of the day, like they say, the best uh, uh, availability avail is yeah. availability. And it doesn't matter if it's one big injury or a series of little small ones. Right. I mean, you're still missing time. Yeah. And for a guy like Langford, maybe more than any of the Celtics' new class, this is a guy they need to play right. every night. I mean, he was suppo he's supposed to be in Maine so he can get those reps up, you know, hopefully maybe join the team later or obviously next season. Right. And to strip him of those minutes in a time of his career where he needs to be playing a lot every yeah. night is, I mean, it's obviously troubling to his growth. No, totally. And that, like you said, they need him to get those reps in Maine. And yeah. Maine has a phenomenal coaching staff at the moment. They have Darren Ehrman's their head coach, who's a former um, New Orleans Pelicans assistant. They have Alex Barlow, who was a Celtics assistant last year. They've got a good staff who can really help him develop. Yeah. This is a crucial time for yeah. development. And so to have him just hanging out at TD Garden with a sprained ankle last night, it, it does kind of stink to watch. Uh, Hopefully this trend will stop. Granted, it's very early. Yeah. Um, I mean, 
like we said, the Celtics have only played 20 games. It's only the first week of December. So it's not panic time yet. We have plenty of time to watch his development kind of, I don't want to say blossom, but they took him as a project. Oh, yeah. Like, I, he, he wasn't expected to come in and contribute right yeah, away. Yeah, it's important also to keep in mind that he's 20 years old. Yeah, like, he's yeah. 20 and some change. Like, he's still a long time left. But it's one of those things where, you know, say he fully recovers from this ankle injury and then sustains, like, another minor one. Yeah. Then you start to creep in your mind, like, not to this ext- extent, but, like, is this kid made of glass? Right, you know? that sort of thing, yeah, which would be very unfortunate. We hope that doesn't occur, um, you know, to the positive side. In his couple games with Maine, he's looked very good, yeah. and he's looked like he doesn't belong in the G League, which is what a lottery pick should look like, sure. even though he's just beginning his professional career. Um, so before we wrap up here, we, as we normally do to wrap up the podcast, we discuss some uh, news and notes around the NBA it's been kind of a like a wacky couple days, uh, specifically on NBA Twitter, uh, with LeBron traveling, with James Harden dunking the ball but not having it count because it was a weird, like he, he, he for those of you who didn't see it, he dunked the ball, the ball went through the hoop but wrapped around the bottom and then hit the top of the rim and bounced out. So so the ball went in but it looped back up and hit the top of the rim again. It's the classic you know, shot that happens on like your Nerf hoop when you're in middle school or elementary school and you try to convince whoever you're playing with that it doesn't count. So uh, give me your your takeaway from the Houston Rockets borderline saying we want this game like under review. We need this win because they ultimately lost by two points because those two points didn't count. Yeah. Which I thought was hysterical. Obviously, If you're the Rockets, it's a maddening result, like you said, considering the final margin. But to just your first aim to come out and being like, all right, we not only want, we expect the league to either (laughs) give us the win or replay this however much time is left. It's like, do you actually think that's going to happen? I thought it was tremendous. Yeah, I mean, I guess like that's abiding under the theory of like the worst they can say is no yeah which obviously they did they did <laughs> but um yeah i don't know yeah, you it, can't really knock the hustle on no Houston's yeah part. i guess like the least you have to do is ask but at this i mean the refs catch enough flack to begin with and this isn't going to help their case at all that they just missed a like you know a sequence where a ball clearly went through the pass. it was pretty bad it yeah. was it was pretty bad um And then we spoke about LeBron before, who was basically crossed half court and then carried the ball, what, three or four steps, I would say. And then uh, in Utah, and the ref was right next to him, a couple feet away from him, and just didn't do anything. I'm not sure if that's a case of traveling no longer being a thing in the NBA or it being LeBron. Um, But the reaction online was, like, wild. Right. It was people exploded yeah it was that kind of stuff is like what nba twitter is made yeah of. and credit to lebron after the game he was he his words said it was one of the worst things i've ever done in my career <laughs> and he said he didn't notice it until halftime the, the part of his quote that i thought was the funniest was he said i was ready to pass the ball and my brain just kind of paused i just had a malfunction i really had a malfunction it makes it seem like lebron's like a, a basketball a robot, robot. He's a robot. Like, yeah everything was you know working fine and then the system went haywire and I don't know what happened. He short-circuited. And another thing I thought that was funny too was he said, I felt bad for the refs on that one because they probably get a write-up on that one, which kind of made me think like the refs might have seen it and they're like, that's LeBron. We know we're not supposed to do that. And then LeBron knows that and is like, I kind of know, you know, in, you know, in one way threw these guys under the bus on accident. So... The, yeah, that was pretty bizarre. The people who dislike LeBron online uh, are, and granted, you're able to dislike like whoever you want. I don't really care. But people who like adamantly dislike LeBron for really no reason kind of ticked me off a little bit. Yeah. But they came out in droves after right. that, which was and absolutely hilarious. Speaking of people who dislike uh, LeBron, the jazz announcers who just acted as if the guy committed an act of treason. He looked like by someone got shot. Taking on the his shoes off, yeah. and, and then he just went off on him. LeBron responded on Instagram by, you know, just saying like, 
99% of the time I'm doing the perfect thing for this league and for you guys to make a big deal of me taking my shoes off <laughs> like imagine living that kind of life and again it's these type of situations where I like you kind of revert to being somewhat of a LeBron apologist it's like yeah like, are we going to get this guy on everything? Yeah, he took his every, shoes off. Yeah, there, come on. And he also gave them to a couple kids in the crowd. Right. Like, I mean, come on. Like, yeah. I, the fact that we even care about that shouldn't matter. But it's LeBron, and we care about and everything. I think, as he points, uh, or when you, I really do think he's become a victim of his own image. Where, totally. like I just said, he's become like ninety nine point nine percent of the time he's doing the exact right thing, whether right. it's how he carries himself, yep. what he says. And it's almost like we're waiting for him to do something. Oh, my God, waiting. Yeah. And it's like you see with like he'll post, you know, Instagram stories where he's doing something and people will rip him to shreds. And it's like everyone around the league is doing yeah, this. Yeah, it's exactly. It's we're just waiting he's for. St- yeah, and I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there'll be something next week where it's the same thing. While we're on the topic of LeBron, uh, I don't think we've talked about this yet. Stop me if we have. The Sierra Canyon, where Bronny James plays yeah. and Zaire Wade plays, Dwayne Wade's son. Uh, the coverage that this high school team oh is God. getting. They have a deal with ESPN Plus where they have 15 games being shown on ESPN Plus, which is more than most G League teams have yeah. on that network, I guess you yeah. could call it. Um, I was reading things, the Washington Post, the LA Times, the ESPN.com. Yeah. Like, it's outrageous. This team had a media day. Yeah. They're a high school team that had a media day. It's almost like ad-libs when you see that these headlines. It's like... Check out Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle <laughs> Union go crazy yeah. after Bronny James throws Catch down a this sweet alley oop. Alley from Z- like, yeah, this is high school. Yeah, like, this what is high school. Here? It's ridiculous. In fairness, though, they are ridiculous. If you haven't watched them, I suggest you should at least go on their Instagram account yeah. because they have a better Instagram presence than a lot of college programs. No, and I just think it's funny that we're a year removed from most of, uh, basketball f- fans thinking like we're never going to see crazier high school coverage than what we're seeing with LaMelo Ball and Zion Williamson. Right. And these guys are blowing them out of the water. Completely like, out of the water. It's, yeah. it's, it's pretty hysterical. Also, the craziest part about this whole thing, in my opinion, this might be a deep cut to like NBA draft junkies, but Brandon Boston Jr. is the best player on that team, who is a shooting guard from Georgia, who I saw he played up in Springfield last year. He's nasty, and he's way better than both their kids, and yeah. he's just getting no coverage at all. So B.J. Boston, Brandon Boston Jr., uh, is really the guy who you guys should be looking out for uh, on that Sierra Canyon uh, program. Realistically, though, none of us should really care about that Sierra Canyon You're team. Right, I, right. I don't think we should be drawing up prospects for them. Real quick before we go, who's your MVP right now? There's plenty of, as we're at that almost quarter point of the yeah, season. Yeah, right at this very day because they have they're on an insane winning streak and you want to give somewhat of a spicy take but it's kind of tough not to have Giannis right now Mm -hmm. I mean the Bucks were looking I mean very very early in the season were looking kind of shaky but now they're looking like the Bucks everyone thought they were going to be was Ruth off 13 13 yeah and it kind of stinks because when you're compiling a list of even a top three. I mean, it's probably LeBron and Harden are yeah. in there. But if you expand the list to like a top five, I mean, Luca's right there. Yep. And Luca's what Luca's doing is outrageous. Right. And if if the Raptors grab you know one of these top seeds, either three or maybe two, if you yeah. know they really push it, you got to consider Siakam. No, t- Siakam's been great. Um, I think my top three, like you said, I don't have like a concrete one at the moment, but. Harden, Giannis, and Luka are all right there. I really, I know a lot of people are against it, but I have a hard time, if I had to pick one right now, going with someone other than James Harden. Yeah, He's averaging 39.5 points a game, seven assists and six rebounds. So, I mean, I get there's flaws in his game, and I get that, you know, yeah, we don't like to watch a free throw shooting contest. But what he's doing is pretty outrageous uh, at this point so I do have a hard time looking past that um, do you have anything else you want to hit on before we wrap this up uh, no I think that's it I think we're me. good yeah. all right so uh, again we're recording this on Friday the Nuggets come to town Friday oh, I'm sorry on Thursday the Nuggets come to town Friday night primetime game on ESPN eight o'clock and then uh, Celtics stay at home they have a Monday matchup with the Cavs before heading to Indiana 
to take on the Pacers, who are also playing some pretty good ball. So an interesting stretch, uh, two good games with a pretty brutal matchup in the middle. But either way, we'll be back next week to discuss all of those uh, news and notes. So we will talk to you guys then. Get out the way. Get out the way. Get out the way.